thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm thrilled to be here to have this conversation with Mona El Tahawi. Um, Mona is an award-winning author, activist, commentator, and one of today's most powerful and important thought leaders on global feminism. She is a Twitter giant and a feminist titan. In her new book, Mona outlines the dominance of the patriarchy in what she calls the trifecta of misogyny, the state, the street, and the home. She lays an analytical geopolitical foundation of patri patriarchal structures and their reach while arming us with seven sins, the seven necessary ways to demand revolution at home and to enact resistance in our own lives. Here is a fearless voice, an unwavering one that embodies the informed fury and ambitious intelligence with which I and many others aspire to speak. Mona and El Tahawi emboldens us to walk and talk towards a revolution that seeks to liberate all of us from the tentacles of patriarchy, race, class, faith, and gender. Ottawa, please join me in wel welcoming her back to our city and to the Ottawa International Writers Fest, Mona El Tahawi. Thank you. Okay. Okay, how are you doing? How are you feeling up here? I'm feeling great. Okay, good. Let's take a glass of water. We can jump right in. We only have an hour. We have a lot to say. Always. <laughs> so Mona, I realized at the after beginning to read your book, that my own understanding of the patriarchy was a little limited and simple. Essentially, bad men doing bad things. But your book taught me that it is more insidious and far-reaching than that. So, first things first, what is your definition of the patriarchy? Thank you, Marissa, first of all, for that very kind introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be back at the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. And first things for me is to say, hello, I'm Mona al Tahawi, and this is my declaration of faith, which I think is quite known now, but I continue to repeat it, fuck the patriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Having laid that groundwork, I can now answer your question. <laughs> So I found that there, there's a lot of confusion about patriarchy, because people write to me and say, who is the patriarchy? They want me to point to someone and say, right there, go get him over there. The patriarchy is an ideology. This is what I'm urging people to start kind of absorbing. Patriarchy is an ideology. For me, it is the most insidious and dangerous ideology in the world. It is the longest, the most stubborn, and the most universal ideology, because regardless of where you live, whether it's China, which just marked 70 years of the Communist Party in rule, or Saudi Arabia, which is under an absolute hereditary monarchy, or the United States, Republican, Democrat, or here, Canada, Parliament House is not too far away, patriarchy is the ideology. And to make it simpler for people, I often tell them, look, patriarchy is not men, and men are not patriarchy. What patriarchy is, I want you to imagine, is it's an octopus. And the head of that octopus is misogyny. Because that's, that's how the ideology of patriarchy um, enforces itself. But it's not just misogyny. And this is where some of you might be familiar with law professor Kimberly Crenshaw's um, intersectionality theory. I use the, uh, the, the image of an octopus. So the head of the octopus is misogyny. And the eight tentacles of that octopus, which is patriarchy, are what we usually refer to as the systems of oppression and the institutions which privilege male dominance. Because that's what patriarchy is. It's systems of, of oppression and institutions that privilege male dominance. So each one of those tentacles is usually context-specific according to where you live. In the United States and in Canada, one of them would be white supremacy, another would be capitalism, another would be ableism, homophobia, class, a whole, all those different tentacles working together. 
In other countries, it could be faith, because in Saudi Arabia, it would be religion. In India, it would also be the different um, religions practiced and followed there. So it's eight tentacles that together kind of suffocate us for the sake of that ideology patriarchy. And I find that that is very helpful because it takes away this nonsense that patriarchy is men. It is not men. And to further that, it's men have to also understand that that octopus is dangerous to them because they too are subject to those eight tentacles. Because when I say that patriarchy privileges male dominance, you have to ask what kind of man is privileged by patriarchy. And in a country like Canada or in the United States, it would be a white, cisgendered, heterosexual, Christian, rich man, able-bodied. See all of those qualifiers? So if you're a working class man, if you're a gay man, if you're a disabled man, you're not going to be privileged. But if you're a woman or a non-binary person or a queer person, you're going to be even less privileged. So I think that octopus is kind of a really good way to show people just how the ideology of patriarchy functions. Beautiful. So um, your book is essentially a, a how-to. Um, the Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls. It's such a great title. It's punchy and it's catchy. And there's a sly reference to the Christian mm. cardinal sins, the mm. capital vices. Why this title? And how did it occur to you to take this approach? Right. Well, I got the idea for the book at the beginning of 2018, because in, in, it was actually in, in February. Um, because I heard that a young Pakistani woman called Sabika Khan had posted on Facebook about being sexually assaulted in Mecca, which is Islam's holiest site. I'm of Muslim descent. And in 1982, I had also been sexually assaulted while I was on the pilgrimage, the Hajj, which is the fifth pillar of Islam. So I wanted to show solidarity with Sabika. So I started a hashtag, hashtag Mosque Me Too, in February of 2018. And it wasn't just to show solidarity with Sabika, it was also to claim a space in Me Too for women of Muslim descent. Because Me Too, as many of us should know by now, was started in 2006 by the black feminist activist Tarana Burke. And she started it for the not rich, the not white, and the not famous. But at the end of 2017, Me Too had become about the rich, the white, and the famous. Because a group of white Hollywood actresses, very courageously, I'm not diminishing what they did, very courageously exposed Harvey Weinstein as the sexual predator that he is. And, and they were followed by many others. But it became this kind of, it, it sounded like it was becoming a movement for very rich, white, privileged, elite women. And that's not what Tarana Burke had intended. So some evangelical women in the US began church too, and I began mosque me too. So that was at the beginning of one week in February. And the hashtag mosque me too went viral. And then five days later, I was in Montreal with my beloved, and we were dancing in a club because I wanted to, to just get, get rid of all the, the, awful, the awful, painful stories that I'd been hearing from fellow Muslim women. So I went out dancing because I love to dance. And we were dancing. I'm now, so I was 15 years old, one five, when I was sexually assaulted during pilgrimage in 1982. In 2018, when I was dancing in this club in Montreal, I was 50, five zero. When I was assaulted in Mecca, I was covered from head to toe except for my face and my hands in what is known as hijab. When I was 50 years old in this club in Montreal, I was wearing a tank top and jeans. And there, in the middle of the dance floor, I felt a hand on my ass and I thought, you've got to be fucking kidding me. This is still happening. So I went, I found the guy who assaulted me because it was, it was a club full of people dancing together and it was just one lone guy, you know, walking away. And I ran after him and I tugged at his shirt and he fell down and I sat on him, and I punched, and I punched, and I punched. And every time I felt I'm done, I was like, no, I'm not done. And I punched, <laughs> and I punched. And every time I punched him, I was like, don't you ever touch a woman like that again. Don't you ever fucking touch a woman like that again. And then he got up, because he wanted to see who is this crazy woman who just beat me up. <laughs> I think I punched him about 12, 15 times. And I looked him straight in the eye, and I went whack across his jaw. I almost broke my finger. And he realized that I was going to beat him up all over again, and he ran away. And my beloved and I went to the bar just so I could kind of calm down and have some water. And the club manager actually came up to me and said, ask me, why didn't you let your husband take care of it? 
I know. I was ready to beat him up all over again. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, first of all, he's not my husband. Second of all, this is my body. I own this body. I take care of it. And so I started a hashtag, because I live on Twitter. So I started hashtag, I beat my assaulter, which also went viral. <laughs> so it, it just occurred to me that, you know, that, that there were all these sins kind of running around in my, my head, you know, like violence, that, you know, women aren't allowed to be violent, because we're supposed to wait. We're supposed to wait for men to miraculously stop raping us. We're supposed to wait for men to miraculously stop beating and murdering us. And then very soon after that, an editor that I have contributed some articles to. I don't work full time for anyone. I'm an anarchist. I find commitment of any kind difficult. <laughs> so this editor, a white male editor, actually said to me, we want you to stop saying fuck on Twitter. I was like, you're fucking kidding me. <laughs> so, so of course I started hashtag why I say fuck. <laughs> so that became the sin of profanity. So I was like, I thought, you know what? I just need to do a whole series mm -hmm. of all of those things that women, girls, non-binary queer people, but uh, the title is Women and Girls because it's catchy. Things we're not supposed to want to be or to do because I am those things and I do those things. And it's all with the goal of saying fuck the patriarchy and destroying that fucking patriarchy. Whew, <laughs> girl. <laughs> just, we're just gonna, let's just do this all night. <laughs> Okay, so let's, for the benefit of everyone here, why don't we go through the seven sins, sure. and you can give us a quick definition of each. So, so they are in order, anger, attention, um, profanity, ambition, power, violence, and lust. Now, anger is a, is a really interesting one. It's just the beginning, and it's just one of seven. And I make a big point in that chapter of referencing several books that have come out recently on anger. And it's like, and you know, I've lived in the US since 2000, the year 2000. And it's like white American women have suddenly discovered they can be angry. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> Many of us have been angry our entire fucking lives. But it's like they act like it's a revolution. It's like, we're all angry. I'm like, yeah, I know. You should have been angry ages ago. And that anger was sparked by the fascist fuck president of my country of naturalization, Donald Trump. Now, anger for many of us began way before Donald Trump. But anger for the white women that I call out in my chapter only began when the Access Hollywood tape of Donald Trump saying, when you're famous, they let you grab them by the pussy. So I talk about how anger is something that those of us who are not rich, not white, not famous, have lived with our entire lives. And if you're a white woman who's just now angry, you're late, but welcome. And I talk about how anger is, is just the beginning, it's just the fuel, the fuel for the engine that is just chugging its way towards that destruction of patriarchy. So that's anger. And then I go on to attention, because I can time, like five seconds after I post anything, some fuckwit will come on Twitter and say, oh yeah, you just want attention. Now, when I was younger and much more earnest, in my fight with men. I'm now like, just like, fuck off. But when I was much younger, I would say, no, oh, I don't want attention. I want, you know, something else. But now I just say, actually, yes, I do want attention. And I want attention because my ideas are important. And my ideas are worthy of attention. And everybody should pay attention. 